in Romans chapter 11. And uh, Romans chapter 11, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach a little bit of a heavy message uh, uh, as far as information and doctrine. And uh, Romans chapter 11 is going to be, I'm going to read uh, verses, we're going to read most of the chapter actually, even though it's a long chapter, um, throughout the message, but it's uh, a lot of uh, doctrine, a lot of things we're going to uh, try to uh, uh, get. And the title is The Goodness and Severity of God. The Goodness and Severity of God. Maybe that word in the title will be capitalized and. Uh, the Goodness and Severity of God. And uh, Romans chapter uh, 11 and uh, verse 18 says, uh, Boast not thyself, uh, boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not uh, the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches are broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. And thou standest by faith, be not high-minded, but fear. For God, if, if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in, the, in his goodness. Otherwise, thou also shall be cut off. And uh, they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, they shall be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if thou went, uh, wert, wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into the good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be, uh, be, the, uh, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? All right, you confused yet? It's heavy uh, reading there, and uh, the context matters. I'll have to dig in a little bit and get you up there. But let's go ahead and have a word of prayer and ask the Lord to bless and Father, thank you for the chance to, to stand here and preach your word. Thank you, people get to hear the word of God, Lord. And thank you for just the privilege of being a little bit of an instrument. I pray the Spirit of God would just fall fresh in us. We meet in the Lord Jesus' name. We're here to, uh, uh, to, to hear your word, to worship you, to sing your praises, to, to, uh, to, to glorify you, to obey. And Lord, I pray today that you would help us grow in grace, help us to understand your nature tonight. A little better so we can know how to uh, uh, spend our time with you and how to have a relationship with you in a new way. I pray that your spirit is speak and your word to be clear. Thank you for the truth of the Bible. Thank you. It sets us free. Thank you already. You've spoken to us. We ask again, Father, you'd speak to hearts in a great way. Some people in, in different places might not be able to hear the word of God this week. Anything else in this message? And we pray that you'd speak in a powerful way. And we just thank you for the chance to preach the Bible and for what it says in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a few things. <clears throat> Uh, Romans 11 is about Israel's relationship to God, um, and that it's not a hopeless situation. Um, if you look at chapter 11 and verse 1, I say then hath God cast away his people. It's talking about Israel here. Now, just let me tell you, if you go to the book of Romans, you will find uh, the book of Romans goes back and forth, Jews and Gentiles, Jews and Gentiles, and, it, and, it, and it, 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 it shows them they both need the Lord, they both need salvation, they're both important to God. And uh, they should, uh, because this time it was very divided. Um, um, of course, New Testament times, the, there was, it began off with just the, the Jewish believers, and then the Gentiles started getting saved, and the, and the Jewish people, uh, many of them rejected the gospel. And, uh, and they were beginning to blend in churches. And uh, one of the many things Romans does is, is tell them, look, you're all, God concluded all under sin, all need the Lord, and and every, Christ is the way for everybody, and uh, and uh, you know that that you're God's children by faith, and all those things. And uh, but uh, Romans nine, ten, and eleven uh, deal a lot with uh, Israel as a nation and God, their position with God, um, because things had massively changed. We'll explain that a little bit. Um, but it wasn't hopeless. And again, chapter one and ver uh, chapter eleven and verse one, it says, "I say, hath God cast away His people? God forbid." That's talking about the Jewish people. For I am also an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. So, so of course, uh, Paul says, hey, look, I'm the apostle. I'm writing the scripture right now, and I'm Jewish. God has not cast away his people, okay? Um, God would never do that. <clears throat> and that's a lot of the theme of the chapter, uh, that you get that. But as a, as a nation, they had in general rejected him. Just like you can have a nation, and you might find a country um, that has rejected the gospel, but you'll have believers there who believe. Um, because though, uh, because you have individuals, and everybody has free will, and everybody can follow the word of God, and uh, it is not a total rejection. <clears throat> Matter of fact, he goes into here and says, even though, 
as a nation at this time, they've rejected the gospel um, and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, um, there are still many Jews that are saved. And he goes, he says, that's always been the history. Even in their darkest times in the Old Testament, when they were going to be sent into captivity and all those other things, even during Elijah's time, when he thought he was the only one, it said, I have 7,000 who never bowed and eat a Baal. And Elijah thought he was the only one. But no, God always has his remnant. And uh, verse 2, God hath not cast away his people whom he, for, whom he foreknew. Watch ye not uh, what the scripture saith of Elias, how that he uh, maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets all day long, and so forth. Um, but verse 4, I have uh, reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not uh, bowed a knee to Baal. Even so, then, at this present time also, there were, uh, remaineth a, uh, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. We've had two different Jewish um, believers uh, uh, that have uh, uh, come to our church, uh, preach in our church, and uh, they they accepted Christ as Savior. We have uh, uh, a person in our church right now who's who's uh, mixed race, half half Jewish, and and uh, you know God God can save anybody, and and uh, there's individuals who can always make those choices. Um, but as a nation, they have rejected the gospel. Verse seven: What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for. To be close to God. But the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. <clears throat> so in general, uh, they have as a nation, but individuals um, are still there. But God has not cast them off at all. He, they're still the apple of God's eye. He still loves them, and uh, he still wants to save them and use them, and he's going to. And we see that. Um, God is moved uh, to the Gentile church this time. Um, that's really important to understand. God has moved the Gentile church, and this chapter talks about it in other places. Uh, talked about that. In other words, you follow that from the beginning, God had a people and a nation. And then uh, God switched over, and he, he switched from a nation to the whole world. Preach the gospel to every creature. And uh, God switched over to that, and so that's where we are now. And, uh, and we'll show you a bunch of, of, uh, uh, of that. Verse 11. And so they say then, hath, hath, uh, have they stumbled that they should uh, fall? God forbid. But rather through their, their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provide them, uh, to, to provoke them to jealousy. <clears throat> now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the uh, diminishing of them, the rich of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness <clears throat> For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, <clears throat> excuse me, I magnify mine office. So he says, look, I'm the apostle of the Gentiles, and I understand God has gone to the Gentiles now. Uh, and, but uh, that doesn't mean that God's done with them by any means, but we are in the time of the Gentiles, verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest... Um, ye should in any wise, uh, in your own conceits, that blindness um, in part hath happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So, just a quick overview. So, God is apple of his eye, Israel. He's worked through Israel. If you wanted to follow God, you had to come and become a proselyte of Israel. They were called strangers, and the Gentiles had come to Israel, follow the, the commandments, but they really couldn't be a part in the same way. They couldn't be in the temple. They couldn't do a lot of things, but the Gentiles could follow God in the Old Testament. Um, in the New Testament, it was prophesied uh, a, a lot of different things, but God would speak to them because a lot of them would reject the gospel, and uh, that he would move on to a new people with a different tongue and with stammering lips. And that time is what's called the, gen the age of the Gentiles, the time of the Gentiles, it's called right here, the church age. And then God is not working through a nation anymore. He's working, and he just says, preach a gospel to all nations. And he's working through who every individual has free will to God, and every individual can follow God on their own, and that's the way God works now, is it's not a nation. It's all nations, and it's all people, and he preached the gospel to every creature, and now is the time of the Gentiles. The majority of the church is Gentile, although certainly um, Jewish believers are all over the world, and and Jewish people can be saved just the same, and they're, they're, there's no difference, the Bible says, it says right here, it says there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. Uh, they're, they're all the same. A Jewish person who gets saved and be baptized and join the church, just like a person from Nigeria or a person from Russia or a person uh, from Chile or whatever, they're all the same. Everybody's treated the same right now because it's the time of the Gentiles. But it's going to go back to Israel again. Okay, it's real clear in this chapter and other passages, but right now we're in the time of the Gentiles. God's using uh, the Gentile church, and that's the majority of salvations. That's who's preaching the gospel around the world, and we're in that time. We see that in verse 25. But 
it's very clear in this chapter, don't boast yourself and think you're better than the Jews because you're a Gentile. Because they might have rejected the gospel, don't say, well, yeah, God's done with them. No, they're still the apple of God's eye and understand they're very sacred to God. And so don't get haughty. And it's very clear, and he's really strong on this. Don't boast yourself against them. They are still God's chosen, uh, chapter uh, 11, verse 16. <clears throat> Further, and God's going to compare the church to a vine, or uh, the believers, God's people, to a vine, okay? And some of the branches are rejected or broken off, and God has grafted us in as a branch, a wild branch, uh, and grafts us into the same body. Now, we're grafted in, and some of the, 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 the Jewish people have been broken off, but it says don't reject them because you are just grafted in. They are the original God's people. And so I'll read that to you. You kind of understand it as you read it. For if the fruits, first fruits be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the roots be holy, so also are the branches. If some of the branches be broken off, and thou, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in. You know, you, you, you dig a little hole in a, in, a, in a tree, and you stick the branch into it. Okay? That's us. It's, it's, we're part of what God was doing. Uh, and with them, a partaker of the root and the fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. But if thou be, uh, if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. In other words, the Jewish, you know, understand, it was brought to you by Jewish prophets, by Jewish scripture writers, by Moses. Your savior is Jewish. The apostles were Jewish. Okay. They're just holding you up. Uh, for a while, and you're grafted in, but don't get haughty against them. And uh, <clears throat> um, and uh, they, they are bearing you, verse 19. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Okay, well, but uh, because of unbelief were they broken off. So it says, hey, look, don't think that I broke them off to stick you in here. They were broke off because of their own unbelief. Okay. That was their choice. I didn't want them to go, but they were broken off because of their unbelief, not so I could make room for you. So don't boast yourself against them. Uh, Boast, uh, uh, verse, uh, let's see, um, verse 20. uh, Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. uh, And thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, the Jewish people, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. So be very careful. <clears throat> and, uh, and and don't be haughty in this thing. <clears throat> and so so don't do that. So he's going to, um, he, so in then verse 22 is a pivoted chapter. Now we've been pretty heavy here. I'll start explaining uh, and, and make it practical here. But verse 22, Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God. Behold, he says, hey, look, now that you understand all that, understand with what he did with Israel, what I'm talking to you about, understand, behold, take a good look at the goodness and, and the severity of God. Okay? Um, On them which uh, fell severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou shalt also be cut off. And so he says, look, you got to take a look, and God has a goodness, and God has a severity to him. And you have to understand that about the Lord. He has goodness, and he has severity. And we see that here. His goodness, I'm going to cover first, and I'm going to explain the severity, and then apply it to us. First of all, his goodness, he still loves them and is seeking them. They've killed his prophets, as Jesus said, thou that killest the prophets, we'll read this verse in Matthew 23, and stonest them which are sent unto thee. He, they've, 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 they've rejected the prophet Isaiah, the prophet Jeremiah, and the prophet Daniel, and the prophet Ezekiel, and, and they rejected uh, 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 Elijah and Elisha for the most part, and so many times they fought against him, and yet God <clears throat> still loves them and is still seeking them. <clears throat> Here's the bad news for you. <clears throat> you ready? Part of the reason that God has saved you and I, is to provoke Israel to jealousy. He wants to bless us so much and show salvation and show the joy of the Lord and the peace of God and an eternal salvation and the love of God on us that he's, he's blessing us so he can look at Israel and say, yeah, look what I'm doing for them. Don't you wish you were back with me? You're eye candy for God so that Israel 
will w- want to go back to God. Now, the Bible deals with that and it says, hey, look, enjoy it. You know, you got the guy driving, giving you a Ferrari and, uh, and, uh, and doing all these nice things for you and all these things. Then enjoy it because God's blessing you and doing all this stuff for you. But understand, he's trying to provoke Israel to jealousy so he can bring them back. He keeps seeking them. And it says this right here. It says, uh, <clears throat> verse 11, I say then, have they stumbled that they should uh, fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. And then Paul says, I'm doing the same thing. He says, uh, verse 14, for I, uh, by, uh, if by any means I may provoke uh, to emulate them, uh, which are my flesh, uh, that I might, that save some of them. So it's, it's, it's provocation. In other words, we're just God just trying to provoke. He loves them so much. He's still pursu- pr- pursuing them. And even with us, we're just, God's trying to get them back and win them back and provoke them by blessing us. And so don't you remember what it's like when I was with you? You know, you, you, you've been without me for all these, all these centuries. Don't you want to be back with me and see the miracles and see the Red Sea parted and see the miracles and see the power of God and see the manna and see me defeat your enemies? Don't you want to see that? That And he's provoking them. Why? Because he still loves them and is still seeking them. That's the goodness of God. Next, he lets us be grafted in to an incredible situation. What a good God. He lets us, you and I, be grafted in. We get to become children of God. John 1, 12, but to as many as receive him, to them give you power to become the sons of God. He, he, we, he grafts us in. We get to be saved to the uttermost, to indwelt. We get to become the temple of God. Children of God. He, we, we get to get heaven as our home. We get to dwell with Jesus forever. We get to be the friends of God. And, and all the incredible things of the New Testament, all the blessings, the peace that passes understanding, joy unspeakable and full of glory, and all the blessings that come upon us Christians, that is a gift from God upon us that we didn't need to deserve. But God is has such goodness. He's made this thing for us so good that even though we're not Jewish, we can have all these benefits of God. Because he's been good to us. Oh, there's so many things. Verse we can, we can mention about this. Verse 12. Now the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more they're full. They said, boy, if God's blessed you so much, think what he's going to do for them. And, uh, and uh, verse 16, it says this, For if the f- first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so also the branches. But if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree, which we are, were grafted in among them, <clears throat> and with them partaker of the root, the Lord, he is a vine where the branches, and the fatness of the olive tree, boast not thyself against the branches. We're blessed. <clears throat> of course, back to verse uh, 30, it's down to verse 30, for as ye in, in times past have not believed God, yet now have obtained mercy through their unbelief. God is good because he's let us have such riches in Christ to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Oh, this is going to say in a couple of verses, the riches of the mercy and goodness of God. God has been so good to us, and he's done this despite we weren't his people, and he's let us become his children. We're children of God, and it's a blessed thing. It's because God's so good. Next, he never gives up on them. He just never gives up on them. <clears throat> Verse 29, for the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. He never gives up on them. Next, they will come back because of his amazing love and mercy. Now, the, 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 the thing is amazing. I'm amazed how many Christians don't understand this doctrinally, that <clears throat> the time of the Gentiles ends and then the time that the, the Jews comes back and Israel as a nation becomes God's people again. Okay, really clear. You can read it, it happens. You can read about it in, in Revelation, and you can read uh, chapter twelve. You can read about it here in in Romans, of course. You can read it in Matthew. The time of the Gentiles end is prophesied to have happened, and they have Daniel's seventieth week, where God is dealing with His people again, and they are His primary people. Why? Probably because the church is taken out, and the last Daniel's seventieth week is His people again. But watch what it says in verse <clears throat> twenty-five. And we read this already. We'll read some more verses. 
For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part hath happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come. Since so, all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come, this is Old Testament, uh, quoting the Old Testament here in, in Deuteronomy. <clears throat> For there shall come out of Zion a deliverer, and shall turn away the ungodliness from Jacob, from, from the children of Israel. The deliverer is going to do that. For this is my covenant with them, when I shall take away their sins. And concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. They were, they were the persecutors. Ask Paul that. They followed him everywhere in the book of Acts. Um, for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. God's chosen them. And he didn't quit choosing them for the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. They're going to come back to God because of his loving, amazing love and mercy. And when it concludes and says, hey, they're coming back to me someday. I'm pursuing them. I'm trying to win them. I'm going to say they're all going to be saved someday. I'm going to reach them again as a nation. They'll be my nation again. And they're going to follow me. I'm going to protect them from the Antichrist. And, and they're going to flee to the mountains. I'll have a place for them. And I'm going to take care of them just like I always did. They're coming back to me. And they're going to receive Jesus as Savior in the end times. Look at and, and what it says about that mercy that's waited so long, so patiently. Verse 33. Oh, the depths, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. It just kind of concludes how incredible is God's mercy that he still loves them and is still waiting. He's still going to save them and work through them. They rejected him for... 3,000 years. That's the goodness of God. And they'll come back. The nation will. I'm not talking that individuals right now can be saved and praise God for, uh, for that. And, and, uh, and we love the Jewish people. And by the way, the Bible says preach the gospel of the Jew first and also the Gentile. They're a priority with God. And we, we, don't, we, 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 love the, we love the Jewish people. They're important to God. But just think of the patience of God waiting thousands of years being rejected and saying, I'm still, I'm still pursuing you. I'm still waiting for you. That's the goodness of God. Amen. Isn't that good? He's so patient and so loving and so merciful. But then it goes back in, in our verse 22, uh, behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God. The word severity as, is uh, apotomia. It means decisiveness, abrupt, or sharpness. It says, God, behold that goodness of God. We just covered that. But also the severity of God. You know what God did? At a certain point, he said, Israel, enough of that. Whack! And he cut him off. And God, it says, hey, take a good note there. Because if you're going to boast yourself against Israel, you better remember, I'm a good God, yes, and I'm a severe God. And boy, people don't like to talk about the severity of God. But that's just as important as his goodness. His judgment is just as important as his love and his mercy. See, it, we'll show you why in a little while, but it's very important. <clears throat> Though merciful, he can be severe, and this is a good thing. He will judge. She says, if he cut off the natural branches, beware lest he cut you off also. He can be very severe. He can just say, I I'm done with that. Enough of you. Whack. So you need to take a note of the goodness and the severity of God. The, and by the way, <clears throat> why would he do it so abruptly? You know, if I had perfect judgment, knew every single decision, I knew everything and I wasn't going to make a mistake, I might make decisions a little quicker too. Because God has perfect knowledge. And he knows when your heart's turned rotten. He knows when to uh, 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 cut you off. He knows when you're going to harden yourself. He knows all those things. And his judgment is perfect. And he says, you know what? It's time that you get, you've got haughty, you've got this, you've got that. And I can be very severe when I need to be. Some people need to be more severe. Now, the people who are severe and aren't good. But balance is goodness and severity. <clears throat> and and that's, that's, that's how God is and the way he is. I can tell you a thousand stories about this, um, just in ministry and, and in people's homes and dealing with, with people in trouble for years and years and years. I, I, I could tell you story after story. I, could, I, I, just, I just think of illustrations. 
where a girl uh, had a boyfriend that beat her up and, 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 and did mistreat her and abused her. And she, yes, yeah, she was good and she was loving and she just always loved him. And oh, when he gets out of jail, I'll let him back. I know he broke my nose. I know, but I love him. No, you need some severity. <clears throat> you need some severity. They're both important. I watched a widow one time with an adult son who just knew how to manipulate her, and he would, <clears throat> he would, he would, he was so verbally abusive, and 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 she and he was messed up mentally, and he would go and he would take her nicest stuff. She was a widow, the stuff from her husband's, and he would go into pawn shop and sell her most vital stuff, and she would kick him out for a week, and he'd say, "Oh, I'm gonna, I can't make it, and I'm just so hard out there." He's a 45 year old man. <clears throat> Lazy, laid around, did nothing the entire day. She had to do the physical stuff around the house. And she needed severity. She needed severity. I had just an article this, <clears throat> this, this uh, last couple of weeks, a couple of articles. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I'll show you in need of severity. Um, <clears throat> oh, let's see. Let me get the right order here. Um, this is from MyNorthwest.com. This is a Seattle article and, and things like that. <clears throat> a bigoted Seattle uh, a prolific offender was quickly released after threatening to stab two gay men with a syringe and called a black female the N-word. This comes after King County announced that they would, uh, wouldn't book most misdemeanor, misdemeanor charges and, and jails have let suspects out over coronavirus concerns. Francisco Calderon uh, has become the face of uh, Seattle's public uh, offenders program. With, the previous, with, the, with previous convictions for sucker punching a passerby, after release from jail, he threw coffee in the face of a toddler. City attorney uh, Pete Holmes uh, keeps giving this, the Seattle uh, prolific offender a chance, even condemning a judge for putting Calderon in jail. Meanwhile, Calderon keeps reoffending with at least 75 convictions to his name. The guy has 75 convictions. The last time they let him out of jail, he threw coffee in a toddler's face. He's walking around with syringe threatening people. And they just keep letting him out. <clears throat> and uh, And that's... <clears throat> what's happened with with the Seattle and with the Seattle um, uh, 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 not the police don't like this but that's what they're not the ones who prosecute okay and uh, and uh, at this point it is willful to keep him out of jail said the uh, uh, Pete Holmes the, the city attorney um, Seattle police responded to a call of a male suspected attending to stab two gay men with a syringe in Seattle's Capitol Hill neighborhood the evening of March 28th Incident uh, report says Calderon started to follow them, got physically between them and to push, to push them apart, telling them that they should not be married. And uh, the police report said they were just friends, according to the report. Um, he also uh, told them he could knock them out with one punch. He had his hands balled in the fist and he had a syringe in his hand. Um, <clears throat> uh, they crossed the street to avoid him. Calderon followed them, then stopped to call, uh, as he saw a vehicle in the roadway. He attempted to open the vehicle's door. Then a, uh, uh, the driver uh, pulled off in a parking uh, and ran uh, black to, re uh, to a restaurant nearby. Calderon, according to the report, pointed at her and, and called in her a N girl several times. While this happened, uh, a King County Metro bus driver witnessed the crime, reported to the police, and they arrested him. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, of course, um, they released him right away. Again. So, what happens when you're not severe and need to be severe? Well, severity is important. This is, this is <laughs> two weeks ago. This is this week, okay, or last week, I guess you'd call it. Uh, Seattle burglary exposed 87% downtown after coronavirus policy crisis. <laughs> crisis. <laughs> what, what do you think is going to happen? They all know they're not going to arrest you for misdemeanor crimes. They've let a lot of the criminals out of prison, and if they arrest you, they're not going to book you. They're not going to prosecute you. They're just going to arrest you and say, naughty, 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 and release you. 
And Seattle, and, and so the coronavirus thing um, uh, has made them let a lot of people out, <clears throat> and they're not going to put people in jail because unless they're killing people. Because why? Because they're afraid they're going to get coronavirus. Well, what about the rest of the citizens? Let all the criminals who are injuring people and swinging needles at people, maybe they should get coronavirus together. Okay? But let the, the people who are just living their lives be safe. But when you don't have severity, when you need to have severity, you mess up things. You mess up your kids. Your kids walk all over you. They scream and yell until they get their way, and you can't tell them no. You can't discipline them. Uh, the schools become chaos. Society becomes chaos. Because the time you say, enough, and the cop walks over there and cuffs them, takes them to jail, and they spend a long time in jail. Or, they, or, they, or the kid gets kicked out of school or whatever needs to happen. Uh, let's see. These uh, cases... Uh, let's see. The Seattle coronavirus uh, crime uh, concerns have uh, become fully realized. Burglary cases have exploded in Seattle's West Precinct since coronavirus stay-at-home order and the county policy prohibiting uh, most misdemeanors, misdemeanor jail bookings went into effect, uh, plus letting criminals out of prison. Uh, these cases are also uh, uh, up significantly citywide. A little over a week ago, off officers argued the the booking policy would result in a criminal free-for-all. Why? Because they know. You, you've got to arrest some people. As of Friday, April 3rd, burglary cases were up 87% over the uh, previous 28 days <laughs> in, in the West Precinct, according to the Seattle Police Department's uh, internal crime database. The precinct in, includes downtown Seattle, the neighborhood of the SPD says most of the burglaries are happening. Uh, and so, so, so forth and so on. And so, and on Twitter, Chief Best told uh, me to check your facts when I tweeted the story of the business boarding up windows due to the coronavirus related crime, but insisted officers are making arrests. The SPD officers are indeed making arrests. Her tweet, however, is misleading in a sleight of hand. Most misdemeanor charges are not booked. That means they, they arrest you, then they let you go. They don't book you, they don't press charges, they don't do anything meaning criminals aren't spending much time in jail. Last week, for example, 75 time convicted, not, not arrested, 75 time convicted. You understand that? Who knows how many times he's been arrested? Uh, the 75 uh, offered uh, offended offender uh, Francisco Calderon was uh, released after allegedly let me threatening people, and we read the rest of the story. You see what I'm saying there? It's not a political thing. It's understanding. <clears throat> you better understand God has goodness and severity. My parents love me, and if I mess up, I'm going to get it. That's good. That's the way it's supposed to be. And, and, and children should not think, and, and criminals should not think, and, 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 and people should not think they can do whatever they want. My boyfriend can beat me up and, and abuse my child and everything else, but I, but I love him. I'm going to let him back because he needs someone to care for No, you need severity. Now, we need goodness to help people who are in need, but we also need, and by the way, every street ministry, every, every mission, every, every street ministry knows this thing. You got to have some rules or you will not help anybody. You got to have goodness and severity. And so God says, behold the goodness and severity. I'm going to go into the severity of God for a minute. He says, he will judge, he will cut off for doing wrong, even though he loves them so much. That's the amazing thing. God loves Israel, and he cut them off and went to the Gentiles and said, enough. And he does those things. Even the ones that he loved, he punished. Uh, back in, in Matthew 23, uh, we see Jesus doing this. We see these moments where God says, all right, enough. Enough, Israel. I love you, but I'm not going to do this anymore. Matthew 23, verse 37 says this, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how oft would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her, her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. He says, I love you. I've tried, Jerusalem, over and over to gather you and protect you under my wings, but you wouldn't, and now your house is left desolate. They're going to come in and destroy this city. Goodness and severity. In Acts chapter 18, uh, we see Apostle Paul going and loving and having compassion. He never stopped having that compassion for Israel. But in Acts chapter 18, again, they came and started a riot and got him arrested when he's trying to preach the gospel and lied about him and attacked him. And he said, okay, enough. 
And when it's Acts 18 and verse 6, and when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said to them, Your blood be upon your own hands. I am clean from henceforth. I will go unto the Gentiles. That's the love of God. That same guy who said this later on wrote, Romans 10, 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. He still loved them just because he had the heart of God, and God still loved them, but he said, all right, enough. Behold the goodness and severity of God, and that's God loves, but he will punish. He will cut off. He will discipline. <clears throat> this is all picture for us to understand God. Just a few things to understand about God, and we'll finish. Number one, God's love and mercy never end. <laughs> never. And we've read these verses a lot lately. I'm going to read these verses. <clears throat> Romans 8. It says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things that come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I love Psalm 136, talking about God's mercy. And God emphasized it pretty strongly. He says this in Psalm 136, it's 26 verses, and in every single verse it says God's mercy endures forever. Oh, give, I give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Oh, give thanks unto the God of gods, for his mercy endureth forever. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord of lords, for his mercy endureth forever. To him who alone doeth great wonders, for his mercy endureth forever. And every single verse, <clears throat> I hate to say this, I memorized this chapter. I was, I, I, I promised God I memorized uh, 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 two verses a day, and I got really busy. I said, I got to memorize something easy. Well, this chapter was easy because I got half of every verse memorized. Uh, his mercy endureth forever. That's pretty lazy, isn't it? And uh, I memorized this chapter. And once I got his mercy endureth forever, I had half the chapter memorized. And, uh, and, <clears throat> and uh, God's mercy never stops. His love never ends. It's teaching us something about God, the way he dealt with Israel. He says, hey, look how I've dealt with Israel. Look, even back with Jacob, even way back then, sometimes when they were coming out, look, I mean, they came across the Red Sea and then doubted me over and over, and they wouldn't go into the promised land, but I still loved them, and I'm still been after them, and then they, they, they had to come under discipline over and over in the book of Judges, but I still loved them. I still had mercy. I'd forgive them at any moment and bring them back, and today I'd still forgive them and bring them back. And all throughout the New Testament, they killed my son. They're the ones who told the Romans to do it. I know it was the Romans. I know it was you and I and our sins that did it. But <clears throat> the Pharisees sought to kill him and paid Judas. And he says, and I still love them. And I still have mercy for them. Don't underestimate the love of God and his mercy for you. It's amazing and it never ends. He never quits loving. He never quits being merciful. Number two, the Lord always has a heart for the lost. Luke 18, 10, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. The entire chapter of Luke 15, <clears throat> It says, talks about a lost coin, a lost sheep. It talks about rejoicing of, uh, 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 in heaven of those who repent. It talks about the prodigal son because God loves seeking the lost. And he's still, after all these years, seeking Israel to come back and provoking them, trying to get him to come back. Because God loves seeking the lost. The Bible says Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. God always has a heart for the lost. And he seeks after them because he loves them. Next, don't mess with God. We read that. If you boast yourself, beware lest God cut you off. Hebrews 12 says a pretty strong warning to believers. Be careful not to mess with God. Remember, yes, he's good. And, and boy, <clears throat> you almost don't need to preach that because that's all every uh, uh, modern uh, compromised churches talk about. Is a love of God without judgment, goodness without severity. But understand, don't mess with God. That's what it says there all over Romans 11. He read all those verses. <clears throat> and, uh, and we see in, 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 in Hebrews chapter 12. For wherefore we receive a kingdom which cannot be moved, let, ever, let, let us have grace, whereby we serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews says uh, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Don't mess with God and think you're always going to be okay and his goodness is just going to keep on blessing you. No, God will whack you. 
He will do that. <clears throat> and he does those things. Whom he loveth, he chasteneth. Oh, he gives strong warnings in Hebrews chapter 10 about uh, despite the spirit of his grace and sinning willfully. And the punishment, how much sore of a punishment you're going to get if you know about the grace of Jesus Christ and so great of salvation and you neglect and, and you go and trod under your feet the blood of the Son of God. You better understand he's severe and that means sudden. And then back in Romans 11, I want to, one more thing I want to give you, that this is teaching us. See, all these things and how God's dealing with Israel teaches us the heart of God and his nature and his patience and his mercy and his goodness and his severity because he loves them that much to do all this and to wait for them. At the same time, he cut them off. And that teaches you the nature of God. <clears throat> but I want to say one of the most beautiful things is God is able and this should teach us about ourselves, that God loves, God's merciful, God will punish, but God is able to bring anybody to himself. In, in Romans chapter 11, verse 23, And they also, if they abide, not, uh, abide still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. What a beautiful thing. God is able to graft them in again. <clears throat> this isn't an end time message. I'm not going about what happens in the end times and all those things and how that Israel receives Messiah and there's two prophets preaching the gospel and 144,000 Jewish evangelists scatter around the world and at the abomination of desolation halfway in, the Jewish people have to hide in, in the wilderness and, uh, and it, their place is protected. The, the Antichrist armies go after them and God opens the earth and swallows up the armies of the Antichrist. He's with Israel and he's blessing them and they're saved and God is able to save them and there's no relative no hard and unsaved person that god can't reach there's no miracle that, that can't be done god is able to bring them back and it's going to take him three thousand years to get the nation back now individual jewish people are getting saved and praise god for that more than ever there, there's a good amount of jewish people getting saved and i praise god for that and and it's wonderful and, and we love the the jewish evangelists that we have met that are that are doing the work of god <clears throat> i praise god for them but i want to say three thousand years of rejection and right now there are there's ultra orthodox jews there's orthodox jews and there's a lot of secular jews israel by and large is a, is a secular nation okay understand even them who seem like they're never going to come to jesus they're going to why because god is able to graft them in and he's able to save them and isn't that and by the way it's an amazing I'm still serving God. It's amazing that I got saved. It's amazing I'm a Christian because God is able. And remember that in everywhere in your life that God is able to do this thing with Israel as a nation. Right now, individuals, but as a nation, that nation is going to receive Jesus and follow God again? Yeah. Simply because God is able. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for these lessons from Romans 11. We can see your heart. We can see your severity. <clears throat> Behold the goodness and severity of God. Lord, I thank you for the truth of the Bible that it shows us we can have, that, that you have both for us. Thank you for your mercy and love. Thank you for your punishment that's just. There's a bad thing and people don't have that. And I pray, Lord, that we would understand your nature. I pray tonight we'd praise you for your goodness and for your severity. I pray your goodness would make us love you and your severity would make us fear you. And we'd be careful and wise. And I pray maybe most of all, Lord, that we would understand that you're able to save somebody no matter how long it takes. That you love and you never, your mercy never runs out. Your love, it never ends. And I thank you for these truths. I pray that we would... Uh, love you more because of this. We thank you that you punish sin with hell. You're severe. We thank you gave your son to wash away that sin. You're good. And Lord, you, you, you don't let things get away with, with, thing, with things they, sh they shouldn't. Thank you for these things. I pray tonight that each one of us would love you more and be more careful in our relationship with you. In Jesus' name.